our head for a moment. We'll ask the Holy Spirit to come and help us all to uh, open our hearts and receive his word. Hallelujah. Father God, we want to thank you this morning for your presence here through your Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ, you paid the price for us. You redeemed us and you have promised to never leave us nor forsake us. And when two or three will gather in your name, you are going to be with us and you are here today. And we pray that as you promised not to leave us orphans, that you are going you are going to send us your Holy Spirit that we receive and who lives in us and is going to be the teachers guiding us in all truth. We pray that he is doing that this morning in our midst, Lord, through your word. Lord, enlighten us, Lord, and strengthen us, transform us through your words that we may be like true followers and disciples disciples of Jesus Christ shining the light in the darkness Lord and living in a way that is pleasing to you Lord in Jesus name and everyone says amen, amen. look to the left and look to the right and smile to someone <laughs> and then let's go to the Word of God hallelujah <laughs> praise God hallelujah a smile does a lot of things isn't it yes uh, hallelujah so this morning I want to continue to talk what I started the last time to talk about your confidence level and this morning I want to look at the source or the reason of our confidence. Uh, slide number two, we introduced this uh, process of growing in confidence the last time through the first level is uh, hearing, uh, hearing the good news, you get in contact with the good news and then you hear that Jesus is God, that he is the Savior. Then you have some kind of analysis, some choice. You start to open up to the gospel, understanding what it says. So you're going through the word and the Holy Spirit convicts. Then you come to the stage of believing. Jesus is my Savior. It, and now you are appropriating it. And then the assurance, uh, the prayer to receive Jesus, and a, a, a new form of boldness, a new desire that is being, you know, a fruit of this new confidence, the new believing. You want to follow Him. You want to, you start to, to tell others that who He is to you. And then when you reach to a higher level of confidence, then you are persuaded. Yeah, there's nothing that will shake this confidence of you. You live by trusting his promises in every uh, uh, situation. You learn to rely on him. You hold fast to this hope that you have and everything. And your life really totally belongs to him. He is Lord and you are following him. So we discussed that in the last time. And we use uh, the illustrations of the... Uh, to show that progressions, the Samaritan woman and the people that she talked to, the villagers who came to rush in this place. And we have a definition, so I just want to bring it back, definition of confidence this morning, uh, full trust, belief in the powers, the trustworthiness, the reliability of a person. And we talk about Jesus, of course, it's a confidence in the person of Jesus Christ. A full trust, a full belief that he has the power, that he is trustworthy, that I can rely upon him. And to have this kind of confidence, you need to know the person, you're, you're the object of that confidence. You need to know that person. You cannot have a confidence in a, in a stranger. Somebody that shows up at your doorstep and wants to sell you a vacuum or something like this. Uh, you know, maybe he's telling you a story. He just wants your money and you want to sell you a vacuum or something else. So you want to know that person more than just that kind of knowledge. And it comes through uh, knowing who Jesus is. So this morning I want to look briefly to a text that we looked at Wednesday night in our Bible study in Luke chapter 5, verse 4 and 5. We will not look at all the verses but we know, I think most of us are very uh, familiar with the story that happened there. Jesus came to this place, it was near the ocean, and uh, he came and the crowd of people just rushed around him because they wanted to hear the word of God. So then he moves away from the crowd and he walks toward 
one boat and he knows what he's doing he knows whose boat it is and he wants to get into this boat and this boat belongs to Peter Peter has already met Jesus Christ we know that by other texts of the scriptures he's already heard the call to follow Jesus he's got a, a good knowledge of who Jesus is but it seems that the click has not come up yet to really realize fully who Jesus is until that time so he comes in the boat he speaks to the crowd and after he addressed the crowd he tells to Peter who has been fishing all night he's exhausted he's tired you know one thing that we said this week if you are a fisherman and what you fish tonight is what your family is going to eat the next day and then the, the, the income that is going to depend upon it you're fishing and you're catching nothing you're going to continue fishing and you're going to continue fishing and you're going to continue fishing three o'clock in the morning four o'clock in the morning whatever time it is because you cannot return without fish you, you, you understand that so that's what happened Peter had this determination to fish as much as possible with all this expertise and all of his knowledge but he caught nothing and he was there in the morning probably like quite upset exhausted he's now you know fixing his nets and preparing for the next day and Jesus is asking something that really doesn't make sense because Jesus is not a fisherman he's just a rabbi he's just a great teacher and he says come on Peter just go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to cast some fish so anyway we can you know imagine what was going on in Peter's mind at this point but then Peter with a lot of respect look at Jesus and says I we have worked all night it's so hard we're exhausted but on your word okay uh, we'll give it a try then he goes and then we know the stories where all they're catching this, this miraculous catch you know and everything and when this happens Peter looks at Jesus and change the way that he is calling him before he, I think it's in verse 5 he calls him master but end of this verse 8 he's calling him Lord and something happens and the realization of who is this man in my boat like a, a fear that grip his heart there's something that he did was not there before you know like Jesus came out from the crowd get in the boat like he's a teacher he's a, he's a great man he's got a great responsibility he might even have uh, called Peter to be his disciple but Peter has not uh, enough maybe reason he's still struggling with the ideas of following this man but now something is happening to him Peter come to realize that this person in his boat has much greater is a much greater person with much greater powers than he thought he knew he thought he knew who Jesus was but he didn't know Jesus at this point that person has greater power and is a much greater person than I thought and then you know one thing that we see and that is a comfort for all of us in this room Pete, Jesus walked away from the crowd and he was now addressing one individual and this is this is the Jesus of the Bible you know many times like a mega church or whatever uh, big organization they always want the crowds they, they functions by numbers uh, bigger is better or something but you don't see you never see that in Jesus Christ Jesus many times you will see walks away from the the fame walks away from the crowd and he looks for individual a, a blind leper and he will stop for the blind leper a woman with an issue of blood he will stop with for her and here is a fisherman what is a fisherman you know like who wants to care about a fisherman you know you you, you want maybe uh, someone in politics or uh, or a great policeman or someone with with this uh, uh, standing in society who wants to take care of a fisherman but Jesus knows you and as he knew Peter and he knew this boat was belonging to Peter and he knew what he was going to do in that boat and he knew the plan that he had formed for Peter just as he knows for you and never look at yourself like you are nothing not important enough not big enough not special enough or whatever because Jesus walks right into uh, your boat 
Hallelujah. And he knows exactly about you. And you know, another thing, another observation about that. Jesus walks in the midst of the workplace. This is the real life, the daily life of Peter. It's not when Peter was in the synagogue that he walks to him. He walks to Peter and his workplace. He walks to you as from Monday to Saturday. Not only on Sunday. The things that God can do with your life is not limited to Sundays. Like, oh, God only works on Sundays. Like many people think that pastors only work on Sundays. So that's not true for Jesus. Might be true for some pastors, but it's not true for, for all, not for us. And it's not true for Jesus. Jesus works in the life of people from Monday to Saturday. Amen? Amen. This, is, this is a fact. And we also have to realize that Jesus Christ knows the complications that Peter has in his life. He knows the problem of a fisherman's life. And he walks into his sphere of life and of work and this man has got no fish he's a fisherman his money for his family depends of the fish that he will catch and he has got nothing and Jesus says okay let me show you that I know what a fisherman is all about let me show you that I have the power to come and help you and your workplace and your daily task and then he did it for a fisherman by giving him a miraculous catch. He can do for an accountant, he can do for a student, he can do for a secretary, he can do for a domestic helper, something for you that he knows your complication, he knows your problems, and he knows your situation, and he walks into your work life, and he works in the midst of your problems, and he knows how to reveal himself as the special person just like he did to that. I, I'd like an uh, amen for this. Because Jesus knew no fish, no bread, or no, no money, no candy, or something like this, okay? And the same way Jesus understands fully the pressures of your life and can just do something about it. And immediately, uh, Peter look at this man and he's not only a simple teacher or an authority a public authority religious authority becomes lord curious and it is truly a term that is addressed to lord the lord adonai like it's not only like just a polite title it means what it says uh, over here and now at this point it shows that he is is a uh, the progress of his confidence is moving forward. He's, he's getting to know Jesus at to a different level. And immediately he realizes his own sinfulness. It's just at the same time. When you realize who you're dealing with, you're dealing with the divine, you're dealing with the holy God, you're dealing with the creator, the savior of the world, you have to see yourself in a different way. And this is where knowing Jesus begins. That's the starting point in our process of knowing Jesus. Your relationship with Jesus Christ, or what we call uh, many times is knowing the Lord personally. Like, you know, it begins always with the realization that Jesus, the, the, the one you have heard from your parents, or the, you know, like me, I grew up in a Catholic uh, church. Of course, uh, I knew about Jesus Christ. I knew a lot of things about Jesus Christ. I've been to the Mass uh, so many times. I've been into a boarding school, you know, with uh, religious uh, teachers and everything. So I, I knew a lot of facts about him. But here you see that a, real, a personal knowledge of Jesus Christ starts with a realization, with a personal divine encounter. It's you that know him that, that you perceive who he is with the greater powers than you thought he was that he had and then it starts with your confession of faith which is very important a realization through the holy spirit of who he is a revelation a realization and then a confession my lord yes jesus be my savior jesus you you know my sin take away my sin you know this this feeling of sinfulness this is when 
anything begins. The knowing God, the knowing Jesus begins at that very moment. And it's true for everybody. It starts with a revelation and it starts with a confession and that's the starting point. But let me ask you a question that we ask on Wednesday night. Okay, now we know that Peter has changed the way that he knows Jesus. He has increased his knowledge of Jesus. Do you agree with that? Yes. So now, can we say that this is the moment when Peter understands Jesus Christ fully? Is that that, that moment that Peter, the apostle, understands who Jesus Christ was fully? No, it is not. And you are right in saying no. It is far to be the moment. But it was, a, we can all agree that it was a uh, uh, essential moment and his discovery of Jesus and it, in his knowing Jesus personally it was an essential moment at this time okay it was the beginning of a process okay so my question this morning is how much do you know Jesus what is now sitting here your level of knowledge of Jesus Christ is it still growing are you still discovering how wonderful he is what is the level of your knowledge of Jesus Christ we know that Peter uh, knew Jesus Christ more at the resurrection it is at the resurrections that the the understanding really opened because Jesus came to them I think it says in Luke chapter 44 and he walked in the room and they were scared and Thomas you know was the one who says if if I don't see and Jesus says touch and you will you will believe why, why don't you believe just you know and uh, they thought he was a ghost Jesus says give me something to eat you know and everything so something outstanding happened at this very moment when he saw Jesus Christ risen from the dead and it says that Jesus explained to them the scriptures explaining to them from the scriptures that he had to suffer that he had to die that he had to be crucified that he had to rise from the dead and and you know to complete his mission he explained that from scriptures uh, to them so at that moment there was a transformation and the understanding of Peter uh, toward Jesus Christ but one more step was needed in that it is when the baptism of the Holy Spirit came on that day that the full realization when Peter started to preach who Jesus is according to scriptures the full meaning of his missions of his coming on earth of who he came to be and to do was complete and him he understood and then you look at all the apostolic message throughout the New Testament the depth of their understanding of who Jesus is has come after the baptism of the Holy Spirit only before that they had a lot of knowledge at different level a human level but it was not the, the divine at that point it's so another point is that it is not when Jesus was physically with them that they really knew Jesus the most it is when Jesus was not with them but the Holy Spirit was with them that they have known Jesus the most and this is very important for all Christians all the world throughout all generation it is the Holy Spirit I will not leave you orphans I will send you another comforter of the same kind and he will tell you everything and he will take of mine and he will give it to you and on that day you will know that's what Jesus says on that day you will know I am in the father the father is in me I am in you and you are in me okay so that is the moment of knowledge is with the Holy Spirit and then you see Peter and John being arrested in the book of Acts and how they replied uh, you know and he says that they saw they were amazed at the confidence or at the boldness in, in uh, Acts chapter 4 verse 13 when they saw the boldness but the word boldness here is also the same as 
confidence is the same as uh, courage the same same word is boldness of speech which comes from the confidence that they have they speak freely openly and they talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and three words that you can uh, observe in this text is perceived and then uh, uh, confidence perceive and realize and these are three very important words and then verse 18 to 20 they charge them they thread them never to talk about this name again and about his resurrection and then that's when Peter and John were so bold whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God you must judge for we cannot but speak we cannot but speak and this should be a result of your confidence in the Lord that there is something that is burning in you something that is alive in you something that has been revealed from the Holy Spirit into your life and you should have this desire to tell others Amen, Amen. So if you are not telling that to other people, there is something wrong, okay? Can we agree on that? Yes. And there should be, I'm not saying that it is easy to, that it is going to be accepted uh, openly by everybody, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the desire, the concern with that fact to tell others about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the gospel, the good news, and, and to express what is important to you now, by, because you know Jesus Christ, this should be, you know, like inside, just ready to get out. Like you, you want to tell somebody, you should want to tell somebody about it. And if you don't, then y you need to pray more, okay? You need to do something about it. <laughs> Hallelujah. What is the reason or the source of your confidence? And uh, I want to turn to the book of Hebrews because there's a lot about confidence in the book of Hebrews. And before we, we read the first verse, if we are to grow in confidence, we need to turn our eyes upward. Where is Jesus now? Where do we live now on earth? So we have a problem here. Jesus is in heaven and we are on earth. Where, okay, what is the sphere in which or where we have all the problems in our lives? It's on earth. What is it that captivate us, overwhelm us, uh, pressure us. Uh, where does it come from? On earth. So, w okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So let's read this text. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. We have a great high priest. This is the main argument of the old book of Hebrews, to show the superior priestly work of Jesus Christ. He has passed through the heavens. Here the verb is like a state of completion. This has been achieved already. Jesus has already done that. He is there, he has passed through the heavens, and he is there, the Son of God, he is there. And because of that, we have to hold fast or confession. And this expression here, hold fast or confession, is like the, the word is, uh, it involves strength, power. You cling to with all of your strength and with all of your energy. And the word confession is, is like the declaration, what you voiced out, what, what you, you claim that you believe. Yes, I'm a Christian. Yes, I believe that Jesus is God. Yes, my sins have been forgiven. Yes, I know that when I die, I will go to heaven. Uh, we have confessed something about Jesus Christ, and we have to hold fast. Because in this book, the book of Hebrews, it is written to a group of people just like us, 
who have believed in Jesus Christ, but through the pressures and the hardships, the persecutions and the un injustice are turning their head backwards and they are thinking of going back. And you know the Jewish society is a little bit like the Muslim society. I understood that more when I went to Xinjiang for the last few years. I've been there a few times. And when you, you look at the Muslim society, it helps me to understand this text. If you are a young man or woman in the Muslim society, and you are going to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are going to run into a lot of problems. The problems that come from the society, and it's not only because it's in China, in the police, it's more than that now. It is the family, it's your own brother, it's your, your, your parents, it's the society, the Iman, and everything that in the society they expect from you. You just cannot walk away from this religion. You just cannot be free. You cannot take your Bible and go and sit on the balcony in the morning with your cup of coffee and read your Bible now because you become a Christian. You cannot do that. Everything you do is you have to hide your new identity, your new faith in Jesus Christ. You cannot live it freely and fully like this. This is a reality. So now if you look into the book of Hebrews, you will realize that the Jewish society of that time is very, very much similar like a Muslim society. You just wouldn't walk away from being a Jew. You just, your parents were Jew. You, you cannot betray your religion, change religion. The temple was there. Moses, you know, told us, you know, so many things and we are disciples of Moses. So it's, it is something very, very similar that you see here. And these people, for different reasons, the society, the families, the religion, the temple, and everything. Like, when you become a Christian, you have no temple. Jesus Christ is in his temple in heaven. It's all in spirit and in truth that you follow Jesus Christ. You have no idols, though the Catholic Church have idols to pray to and to bow before. But in true Christianity, you have nobody to bow to. You have no picture to adore. You have no temple to go to. You just have a relationship with an invisible God. Invisible, immortal, that's what we read in Timothy. That's what you have. It's a confidence. That's what it means here. A confession of your faith. I believe that He exists. I believe that He is. He is my Savior. He is with me. He's, he's, he has a plan for me. I say yes to His plan. But that, con that confession of faith, that profession of faith, that confidence that you have is going to be attacked to the left and to the right by all sorts of problems. It's going to be crowded by all sorts of other uh, distractions, uh, desires, uh, you know, all sorts of other things. The Bible calls it uh, sometimes lust, greed, uh, selfish desires, self-gratification. There's a lot of things on this earth that comes against this, con this confidence that we have to weaken it, to shaken it, to maybe call us to walk away from it. And we know we know, looking at friends, friends that we have met in the church before, looking at church history, we know that many have walked away from the faith. So it's either you grow in confidence, or it's either you allow your confidence to be weakened and to maybe vanished. It's either one way or it's on the other way. And here it says, you have a high priest that is right there and he is passed through heaven. So, hold on. A bit like what Pastor Curtis was saying last week, continue. Hold on, just hold on, hold on, hold on, refuse to let go. You know, Jesus is in heaven now. You know, many of us, we, without saying it or really we have an image of Jesus Christ like he has come on earth, he gave his life, he shed his blood on the cross, he died, he said, it's finished. Then he went back. It's like we have a picture of him going away, leaving us. He finished, he finished. Like when you finish your work, you leave your work, you go home. 
you know? So it's like he finished his work, he's going home. Now he's home and he's doing something else. No, the Bible is very clear. He is still continuing his work, his work that relates to your salvation experience to make you more complete, to perfect you, to sanctify you, to transform you, to make you ready for heaven. He is now at work for you. He is there working for you. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. I want to go on a bit further. Hebrew chapter 6, verse 19 to 20. Where is Jesus now? We have this hope as an anchor for our lives. I'm reading the Good News Bible. It is safe and sure and goes through the curtain of the heavenly temple and to the sanctuary. On our behalf, Jesus has gone there before us and has become a priest forever in the priestly order of Melchizedek. Let's read also the New American Standard. It's a more standard uh, text that we are used to read. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil. Where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever. Where is Jesus now? Where is Jesus now? Within the veil. He's already entered there. And it says that we have a hope because he is there. We have a hope. This hope is like an anchor. How many of you know what an anchor is? What it is useful for? We know anchors. Okay. Our anchor should be set where? In the sanctuary. But I think, unfortunately, many of our anchors, and that's the point that I want you to really consider this morning, Many of our anchors are set on earth. Is that true or am I making it up? We are living on this world. We are absorbed by this world. We do everything about this world. Our pressures are in this world. It's very easy and natural for us to look down and to see what's here. And it's, I'm not saying it's wrong. It's just natural. That's the reality of all of our lives. But here it says, if you want to be victorious, if you want your faith to be bigger, stronger, overcoming, you need to set your anchor within the veil. What does that mean? It means, very simple, more prayer. It just means that. More prayer, more attention to more focus above, more lifting of our eyes, more keeping alive the hope, the hope and the reality, the, the intimacy, the relationship, the daily devotion, the reading of the Bibles, the hope that Jesus is coming again, that he is preparing a place, that he is there for me, that he is helping me, that he has power for me to lift our heads more than what we do. That's my point today. To keep fresh that communication between me on earth with all the mountains of problems that I have uh, with relationships, with work and with money and with everything, but to keep it fresh that I depend upon him. He's helping me. He's there for me. Jesus help me today and to keep it fresh and go and to the, it, w within the veil. I must go within the veil. I must lift up my faith. I must, in my prayer, in my daily devotion, really make sure I'm going within the veil. Because when I go within the veil, I will be restored, I will be refreshed, I will be strengthened, I will be seeing a reality that I don't see. I will be understanding differently. I will be loving differently. I will be strengthened of spiritual power within me because of going within the veil. That's my message this morning as a church, as individuals. If your prayer life has diminished, if you are, you know, burdened, oppressed, 
this courage, uh, you are overwhelmed by whatever is happening in your, in your world and in your situation, you need to do something more. You uh, lift up your, your eyes and go where Jesus is. He is there with you forever. And when it says that he has become, it says here, having become, this is a verb that started the past and continues in the present and c is going to continue in the present. He has become and he is now and he is doing that for us. He is a priest forever. He is a priest forever means he is a priest today. He is a priest on Monday morning. He will be a priest until Saturday. He will be a priest next week, next month, and then 10 years ahead. And your retirement plan, Jesus will still be the priest when you will need your retirement. You know, whatever you will need, Jesus is going to be ahead of you because he is a priest forever. Okay, so this is a confidence that we have, that we have to have a confidence. You know, we are consumed, we are overwhelmed by our earthly obligations and most of our desire, just, just, just let us be honest this morning, most of the thoughts and the, what consumes our daily activities in our minds every day are, uh, you know, earthly things. I mean, th this, is, this is the reality, I think, of all, most of us. Our happiness. We link it to earthly things. If I can get married, if I can get that job, if I can go here, if I can get this vacation, if I can buy this dream house, if I can reach to this place, if I can do this, if I can. most of our goals and, and, our, and our plans are linked earthly. You know, if we would be living in a society where we have nothing, I think maybe it's easier to lift our eyes upstairs, but we are so doing so well, you know. You all dress so beautifully here today, and you know, I don't see anybody's with their hair is like like this, like that, you know. You look so great, and we are so blessed. We are we live such in an abundance, and it is so easy because of that to to slide away, to drift away, and to not to keep this. Uh, let us hold on to this hope, to this confession of our faith that we used to have at the beginning, this zeal that we used to have. Okay, do we do we understand that? Yes. Okay, Hallelujah. Lacking in confidence produces other kinds of fruits also. Like having confidence will produce certain type of fruit. Lacking confidence will also produce. Lacking in confidence will produce as uh, fruit uh, fear. Fear of people, fear of confessing your faith, fear of even of the future, fear of lacking money, fear of uh, not getting married, fear of uh, whatever it is. <sighs> I'm, I'm speaking to a church made of many women, so I need to talk about that, okay? <laughs> Other kinds of fruits, maybe distrust, uh, self-protection, and self-protection, like you, you protect yourself because you don't have a, a big confidence, so you have to be in control of self, so it leads to protecting yourself with, with uh, projecting a false, a false yourself, a false self-image. Uh, so that leads to pretending and, and deceit. And we have the example in the Bible that is so clear. Ananias and Sapphira, they were in the early church. They were in the midst of a revival. But because of this lack of confidence, wh why did they have to lie about their property? Why did they have to keep the money? Why? Where was their confidence? The confidence was in their property, wasn't it? And their reputation. So they just projected a false image of themselves. They were just pretending. And it will lead to many other things, a disappointment, abandon, and everything. You know, Paul, talking about anchor, Paul in the book of Acts was in a big, big storm. You read that in Acts chapter 27. And at one point, they had to let go the anchors the earthly anchors. We read that in verse 40. They let go the anchors and left them in the sea. Meanwhile, losing the rudder ropes, loosing, and they hoisted the mainsail to the wind and made for shore. They had lost all hope. 
they were all going to die. Actually, the, 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 the sailors had tr tried to lower the boats this is, and run into that. But Paul says, if they leave, we are all die. Let, don't let them go. And verse 44 says, and so it was that they all escaped safely to land. You know why? Because on that boat, there was one man who had a confidence, who had an anchor somewhere else. You see, these people had anchor. At one point, they threw away in the ocean, they not threw away, but I mean they lowered four anchors. They wanted to secure the, their, their boat, so they, they, they dropped four anchors to secure it, but it didn't work. Then at the last moment, they had to cut the rope of the anchor and let the boat go to shore, and the boat came to the rock, broken two, and then they were all going to die. The soldiers were going to, to kill the, the, all the, 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 the slaves and all the prisoners. And then finally, they swam and they made it to shore and they were all safe. Why? Because just a few hours before that, Paul said in verse 23 to 25, last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me. This is a confidence. This is an experience. And he said, don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. You know, never forget the plan that God has ultimately. If God has a plan for you ahead, whatever happens to you along the way is not going to take you off the road to go there. God's going to bring you there. It might be rough, but he will take you there. Don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God and his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. And he shared that message. So take courage, for I believe God. And now, now Paul is telling that to the crew, to the captain, to the, the Roman soldier in charge. So take courage. For I believe God, it will be just as he said. So that's his, his, his confidence. He his shares his confidence to others. And what we know at one point, they have to let go of their earthly anchors so that they can be safely because Paul had the anchor above. That's an, that is an illustration. Elevate your goal. Elevate your ambitions. Elevate your faith what God wants to do in your life. We do not exist as a church. You know, like, like a few weeks ago, Pastor Jennifer and myself, we shared that we believe that Lighthouse, as a church, we have come to a new season of reaching out, of, of uh, evangelism, of mission. It's not only words, but this vision, this desire is going to take place when we all you know, go upwards within the veil and we can all receive a similar vision and have faith and enter into the plans that God has for us as a church and individually. And that takes your willingness, that takes your confidence, that takes your faith to come along with ours here. And maybe we need to leave some of our earthly anchors and start to, you know, make sure that we have one solid, safe and steadfast, safe and secure, one that will be unshakable, an anchor that is within the veil. And it is within the veil that you started this new life in Christ because he returned within the veil and he made your salvation possible and he has become and is going to continue to be your great high priest and he is there for you on your behalf forever, forever for you. And if you connect with him where he is, you will be safe and you will be secure and you will make it to heaven. But if you don't, if you let the, the you know, like, you know, an, an illustration, another simple illustration, Jesus says, and the weed, the weed choked the wheat, the wheat, huh? the, 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 the bad choke the good, the earthly, the, the cares of this world, the, the greed, the lust, and all of these things from this world, it choke. It chokes you, it chokes me because we are living this life here. But what will uh, enable us to make it, to be fully accomplishing the will of God is to connect 
within the veil with Jesus Christ. This is true, what I'm saying this morning. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. And uh, one more thought this morning, because I, I wanted to use uh, Renalin's illustration, because I look at one of the comments that she made on, on Facebook. And this week you have seen uh, the presentation of Pastor Jennifer. It's very clear, and you, many of you read it on the internet. And this is what she had to say after the events, uh, when people were responding, saying, praise God, God is good, and all this. She says, yes, he is awesome that in the midst of war, we can be at peace because he is our great warrior. That is what she says. In the midst of war and all the troubles and everything that could have turned bad, she was running here and there, putting her confidence. Because she has a confidence, she has a direct line to, to heaven. And we know that. You, you, can, you know that by reading just what she writes and the way that she expresses herself. Uh, she's not making it up. She's not pretending. She's not putting on a false, uh, you know, like using words just to impress us. You know, uh, Renalin, and you know what she wrote is, is absolutely from a result of her prayer to God and her zeal and her love for Jesus Christ and her connection in heaven. All glory to God, our Redeemer and Protector. We can rejoice in the midst of crisis because we are secured. He loves us. This is the connection in heaven, that he is working for our own good. May God reign in the hearts of people here in my hometown. She didn't say, oh, God, save me, save me. She says, may God reign in the hearts of people here in my hometown. She's asking for three years. She has a goal to reach out to the people there. Whatever happens, that's, that's a fruit of a confidence that has an anchor within the veil. If you don't have that, you cannot have, you cannot speak like this. You cannot write like this. You cannot live like this. It's impossible. You, you, your standards of life will be lowered to only surviving in this uh, earthly life. So if you want to live a life that is better than just surviving down here and complaining how tough it is and everything, but to live with meaning, meaningfulness and bearing fruit, we need to make, create the connections or restore the connection that was there in the heavenlies within the veil. Amen? Amen. Let us stand this morning. Hallelujah.